Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Glad you're here. <clears throat> and for those of you who can't be here because you're looking at this at another time and another place, you're with us too because you're in our prayers and in our thoughts and we miss you. Amen. <clears throat> uh, before we begin, let's check the prayer list with any changes, updates, corrections, additions, or whatever that we need to vote on that. I added Jerry and Brenda, that'll be they'll be printed on the next one, the next bulletin. Uh, are there any, any others? Anyone that can be this doing better and can be removed or uh, any changes? I guess you could take my sister off for a while. Okay. Is she doing all right? She's doing good. Okay. Let's do that. Lois, it's good to see you back. Thank you. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom. Add Chris and Paul to your list. Chris and Paul Byers to your list. Chris and Paul Byers. Byers, B Y E R S. Yes, Paul. Brenda called me last night and uh, she didn't, she like wait, but she's had this terrible headaches. There was a lot of things going on. And she couldn't talk in a few minutes, but she said she's pretty weak. And she did talk with bad headaches. I think you're those getting one to sick. Yeah. Okay. Any more? Let's pray again then. God, we love you and we thank you for loving us. We thank you so much that you're, you're with us here now. We feel your presence. We, we see you in each smile and each kind word. We know you love us, God. Your love is all around. We thank you. We pray for these, God, who are on, their, on this prayer list. You know them all. We don't personally know all of them, but, but you do. And, we just lift them up to you and ask you, God, to touch them and bless them, each one according to their need and, and your will. God, we, we thank you for this time to be together, to get a message from you, hopefully, and something that we can, we can leave here with and put into practice in life, something that might inspire others, lead others to, to a closer walk with you. God, we give ourselves to you now. Use us according to your perfect will and lead us to that end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I do a poem every once in a while. And recently or not, but <clears throat> but if I have, just, just smile like you, have, you haven't heard it before, okay? So, <laughs> it's called Life. So long and hard, seeking only my way, from God farther and farther I went astray. In sin's deep darkness with so little light, afraid, lonely, cold, and no relief in sight. Lost, bewildered, and tired, my affliction out of control and desperate for direction, still pushing on in search of the next thrill. Maybe, maybe it's just over the next hill. Times and miles, their toll it will take, leaving hurt and shame in their wake. A life of my choosing, now a better time. From the bottom, the only way was up. When in my despair came a small voice, <clears throat> it was Jesus, make me your choice. Mm. Never will I leave you, he would say. 
Come and follow me, for I am the way. Once in darkness is there now light. Peace, happiness, and rest are in sight. With purpose, confidence, I have direction. It was Jesus who wrought my correction. So if out of control your life is spun, for relief you searched, finding none. Turn only to Jesus. He's all you need. Hasten to Him. Your cries He'll heed. Alone would you never, never again be. Walking with Jesus, you're forever free. Living in His light, His love and grace, hold to Him. The past never to retrace. Amen. Amen. Um, in, in keeping with the rest of this today, you notice notice that the, some of the flowering trees are, are blooming in some places. If, if you look closely, you'll see the tips of the branches on trees begin to change color. A little green here, a little red there. Spring is not far off, we hope. And it's a sign of new life. And we have new life too, don't we? It is. We'll talk about another chance. What's well, often painfully obvious that we don't always get it right the first time. <laughs> Ladies, you remember the first time you made biscuits or maybe you fixed a whole meal? <laughs> <laughs> Probably a whole lot younger than you, than you are now, but that, that memory might not be so good and you haven't forgotten. But guys, how about your first attempt at constructing something on your first auto repair? How did that go? <clears throat> when learning a new skill, trying a new recipe or building something you never attempted before, your first effort might not turn out ideally. It might even be a mess. Such bloopers could be costly in terms of lost time, wasted materials or ingredients, to say nothing of the frustration and embarrassment to follow. Then you're given another chance to hone your skills, to learn from your mistakes, and become more confident, better at what you do. So much of life is about not getting it right the first time. Your life goes on, and we try again and again, hopefully improving with each successive attempt. God knows this. And as we read in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, mm -hmm. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins mm -hmm. and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we, when we repent, God cleans our slate and gives us another chance mm -hmm. to get it right. <clears throat> Most of us at one time or another have had an illness or an injury which may have left residual effects, some more profound than others. We may have scars, the results of injuries or surgeries, or we could have been left with a condition which changed our life, literally. We can look at the scars as blemishes or the challenges as burdens, or we can look at them as a reminder of the times when God kept His promise that He would never leave us or forsake us. That in the most difficult of times, He would even carry us. We should be thankful for His love and for another chance. And look at those scars or whatever in that same way. They remind us of what He's done for us. Have you ever been on either side of a broken promise? Have you ever failed to keep a promise you made? Has someone failed to keep a promise that they made to you? The feelings which follow can run deep and last a long time. The wound of a broken promise can cause emotional and even lead to physical harm. Mm. Often retaliation comes into play. Do you remember though, being told as a child two wrongs don't make a right? Mm -hmm. That was one of mom's favorites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes the wounds heal quickly and life goes on. Then there are those broken promises which may never really heal. Instead, they leave long-lasting emotional scars. The first step to healing from, the, from a broken promise is forgiveness. Amen. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul was writing about truth and love and had this message in chapter 4, verse 26. Be you angry and sin not. Somebody was talking about that a while ago. <laughs> and let not the sun go down on your wrath. In a, an unresolved grief, grievance, especially between Christians, mm. like an untreated injury, mm. will fester and get worse. Uh -oh. 
Everyone knows of a situation in which two people, or maybe groups of people, were estranged for years over what was a trivial matter. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe even just a simple misunderstanding. In such cases, we're often our own worst enemy. Instead of seeking or offering forgiveness, we keep pulling this cab off the moon. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it doesn't heal, and nobody gets another chance. Paul continued in verse verse 31 and 2, saying, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all that malice. And be you kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. As we have been forgiven and thereby given another chance, so too, so too, must we forgive others and give them another chance? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's often a seemingly insurmountable task, but remember what Jesus did for us. Yes. David wrote in Psalm 32, verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Christians, we should continually thank God for his forgiveness, mm -hmm. for a clean slate, for that another chance. Mm -hmm. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you in his name's sake. It was written by John in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 12. What a comfort, what assurance it is to know that our sins are forgiven, that we have another chance. Often, through forgiveness, we hold the key to another chance for someone else. Who are we to withhold forgiveness? In his great love, God has often shown forgiveness and given mankind another chance. As far back as the garden, as far back as the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, He made a way for them to, to live on, albeit not with the same privileges as, as before. But they got another chance. Genesis 3 tells us what we refer to as the fall of man. In just ten, ten generations this side of, of Adam, mankind had become so wicked that God was repented that he'd even made man. Mm -hmm. Genesis 6, uh, 7 says, And the Lord said, I will, will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and fowls of the air, for it repents me that I have made them. Mankind must have surely hit rock bottom to cause the creator of all, the most holy God, to regret having made man. God decided to destroy all flesh. He was going to wipe the earth clear of the life he had created. This must surely have grieved him. It must surely have grieved him. He determined he would bring this destruction about by causing a great flood. A just man, one who walked with God and who, having found grace in the eyes of, eyes of God, Noah, was assigned by God the task of building a big boat one big enough to house Noah and his family, and enough animals to re replenish their species. Through Noah and his family, God was giving mankind and the world another chance. The details leading up to, through, and following the flood are found in Genesis chapters four, uh, 6 through 8. In Genesis 9, God gives his promise to never again destroy the earth with water or flood. He says in verse 11, And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. As a reminder, he said in, in verse 13, God said in verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Next time you see a rainbow, mm -hmm. thank God for this reminder. And thank him for giving mankind another chance. There's one short book, Jones, just four, four chapters. It tells of a time wherein I found several instances of another chance. The city of Nineveh had become so wicked that God directed Jonah to go there and cry against it. God said, said in chapter 1, verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for the, their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah didn't want to follow God's will. He boarded the ship out of Joppa bound for Tarshish with the idea that he, he could remove himself from the presence of God. But he wasn't going to get off that easy. Hide from God? Really? 
God caused a great storm on the sea, so much so that the others on the ship feared for their lives because the ship was in danger of breaking up. When they determined that Jonah was the cause of the evil which had befallen them, they ultimately cast him overboard, at which time the raging sea subsided. They were given another chance. Founded in the sea, Jonah, Jonah's life was in danger too, although he would later indicate his wish to die. God promised, uh, provided a great fish which swallowed Jonah, and he stayed in his belly for three days. Hmm. That's indicative of another three-day time frame, isn't it? Jesus being in the, in the tomb. Hmm. The fish vomited Jonah, put Jonah out on dry land, and Jonah had survived. He had another chance. Again, God directed Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach, telling the people that their days were numbered. Soon they would be overthrown. The people of the city had a change of heart. They believed in God, or they believed God. Mm -hmm. Turned from their evil ways and violence. <coughs> Chapter 3, 10, 3 and 10 says, And God saw their works, that they had turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said he would do, do to them, and he did it not. None of them was given another chance. The book concludes in chapter 4 with Jonah being displeased that none of them had been spared. It seems that he believed they should have been held accountable for their ways and not given an opportunity to do better. He goes into a funk or a pity party expressing his wish to God for his life to be taken. Jonah ends, the book of Jonah ends, leaving one to believe that he failed to make the best of his having had another chance. Jesus had friends named Mary and Martha and, and their brother, brother Lazarus. They sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick. John 11, 4 states, When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. <coughs> but Jesus didn't go to the aid of Lazarus right away, did he? He stayed on for a couple of days where he was before announcing to his disciples that they were going to Judea again. His disciples warned him of the danger, or reminded him of the danger of going there, but he gave them assurance. Then he said in verse 11, Our friend Lazarus sleeps. When I go, that, and that I may wake him out of sleep. Mm. Well, they thought that Lazarus was actually asleep, but in verse 14, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Mm. Martha met him along the way, telling Jesus that he had been there, and Lazarus would not have died. In verse 23, Lazarus said to her, Your brother shall rise again. Well, Martha thought he was talking about the resurrection, the last day. And Jesus responded to her in that most powerful way, saying in verse 25 and 6, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. And whosoever believes in me shall never die. All right. Believe you this. Martha confirmed her faith that he was Christ, the Son of God. Mm -hmm. After Mary joined, joined them, Jesus inquired as to where they had laid Lazarus, and they led him uh, to the place. And in verse 35 says, Jesus wept. Mm -hmm. He gave thanks to his Father, praying that this would result in, in that those around would now believe that he was sent by God. Verse 43 says, And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. When he came out, Jesus told him to loose him and let him go. Lazarus was alive again. He'd been given another chance. Some speculation is around concerning Jesus crying as he went to the grave of Lazarus. And one wonders if he was just sad that Lazarus had died. Was it that the, the faith of his friends was not quite as strong as it could or should have been? Was it the unbelief of others in mourning? But then maybe it was that he knew that Lazarus would, instead of going on to heaven, have to continue to endure life's challenges, trials, and temptations for a time only to face death again. Mm -hmm. In his early ministry, Jesus healed many others who had been afflicted with health problems, birth defects, blindness, demon possession, among other things. 
Mm -hmm. He even replaced the man's ear that was cut off just before he was crucified. Mm -hmm. in, so many, in so many cases, Jesus made it possible to, for people to have another chance, and for some, maybe even their first real chance, considering those who had had a problem from birth. As we mentioned at the outset, maybe you or someone close to you has experienced a life-threatening injury or illness from which, by the grace of God, you or they lived to tell, to tell the tale. He gave you or them another chance. May you, may they, never be guilty of taking such gifts for granted or of taking God for granted. Mm. The questions arise. Am I a better person now? Am I closer to God? Am I more about others than me? What can I do to be more like Jesus? Or am I going on with life just as before, as if nothing special was given to me? Self-evaluation is something we all must do, especially when we've been given another chance. The Bible cites many in instances of Israel's disobedience and rebellion against God. How God dealt with ancient Israel paints a picture of His great mercy and grace. These were God's chosen people, and yet they did everything imaginable and some things unimaginable counter to the will of God. They made and worshipped idols. They killed the prophets. They refused to acknowledge Him as their God, as God Almighty. They ignored his laws. Time after time, their stubbornness and wanton ways got, got them into trouble, and they find themselves in dire straits. And God was faithful many times, giving them another chance. Hmm. They were their own worst enemy. There are times when God would punish the people of Israel. One such time was when they were held captive in Babylon. Sometimes adversaries would overtake them, killing many, but God, in His great mercy, would allow some, a remnant, to survive, providing another chance. From the seed of Abraham, Israel was made a powerful nation. God, having delivered them from bondage in Egypt, and made them a blessed nation. He promised them He would save them, and He did. He protected them, led them through the Red Sea, fed them, and promised them a land that flowed with milk and honey. So often God was generous in His provision to Israel. Yet they found fault, they were ungrateful, showed no appreciation for all God gave them. They simply took Him for, for granted, if in fact they even acknowledged Him at all. <coughs> on another occasion, God led them across the Jordan River on dry land and as they began their conquest of Canaan and got another chance. Through the centuries, the history of Israel resembles a roller coaster. The times in which they lived well, lived closer to God, only to fall back into their old ways again. Often they would be at war with others, with themselves and even with God. It seemed like they could get along with anybody for a long period of time. Through it all, God's love for His people never stopped. God is truly one who forgives and gives another chance. A capsulation of Israel's ups and downs is found in Nehemiah 9, 9 beginning in verse 18, which reads, as though one, of one talking to God, and says, Yea, when they had made them a molten calf, and said, This is your God that brought you up out of Egypt, and worked great provocations. Yet, yet you, in your manifold mercies, <coughs> forsook them not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. You gave also your good spirit to instruct them and withheld not your manna from their mouth and gave them water, water for their thirst. In verse 21, Yea, forty years did, did you sustain them in the wilderness so they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. Time after time, time after time, God gave the people of Israel another chance and another chance. To presume to, presume to know the full depth of God's love, His grace and mercy is ridiculous and foolish. We can't know that much. 
we know that Jesus died for us, but he paid a debt for us that we, uh, he didn't know, and one we couldn't pay. But we measure everything on a human scale. We just can't comprehend his greatness. Reading the story of Israel might cause one to wonder why God tolerated the acts of such a rebellious people. We might say God was too patient with them, but who are we to question God? The story of Israel as recorded in the scriptures is not unlike a mirror. It makes clear that the picture of Israel is the picture of all peoples. It's the picture of man's failings and God's mercy. It's the story of good and evil and a stark reminder of how evil seems to too often win out. A somber thought, though, is that the blood of Jesus is on all our hands. He died for all of us. No one is perfect. No, not one. It's also important to remember that even greater than the knowledge of sin is the understanding that God will forgive, will give another chance, and will show his great love to a creature so unworthy. And of course, as we just alluded to, that ultimate second chance is the salvation that's made available to us through, through Christ. That's our ultimate second chance. Waking up this morning, waking up this morning, God gave you the gift of another chance. An opportunity to mend the fence, patch up a broken relationship, a time to say, I'm sorry. A time uh, to offer that neglected or overdue thank you. A time to say, I love you. A time to make that call or send that note to someone lonely or hurting. A time to say, I forgive you. Don't put off, don't put off or squander another opportunity to do what's right, what, what God would have you do. He's given you yet another chance. Make the most of it. Let's pray. Amen. You are a God of second chances, of another chance. Lord, you're so, so loving, so, so faithful and so forgiving. And yet, sometimes we take you for granted. God, please forgive us for that. Lead us, God, in your path of righteousness. Help us to be more of what you want us to be and less, less of what and who we are. We know we fall short. Just please continue to help us as we, we want to please you. We want to do better. We want to, we want to be more like you. So God, we do thank you for this time together. We'd ask that as we leave now, we, we take you with us and let others see you in us, <coughs> that they may be drawn closer to you too. Thank you again, Lord, for, for your great love and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.